The Lord be with you. Thank you very much. We'll look at several texts uh, today. It's all right. We talk about the uh, subject of adultery, of course. We, we have to factor in Christ's words from Matthew chapter 5, but we also need to talk about marriage as we as Christians understand it from the Bible. And I think you get this, but in the Christian church, those of us that trust that the Bible is in fact the inner, infallible Word of God, that it is His Word given to us, that we believe that marriage is between a husband and a wife, a man and a woman. And that's it. There is no option for same-sex marriages. Now, that doesn't mean that we get to be mean or hateful and don't do that. In fact, <laughs> telling someone you're a Christian and being mean and hateful doesn't work very well. Amen? Right? Amen. All right. So, but God laid it out. And this is the thing. I say this all the time. You can't say, I take Jesus Christ and him crucified and risen again from the scriptures. I believe I'm going to heaven because of what the Bible says about Jesus, but I don't want any of that other stuff. Right? Give me a bottle of whiteout. Give me a scalpel I'm, or you know, a, a razor knife. I'm going to take out that other stuff. It really is, Christian, if you don't hear me say anything else, hear this. The Bible, Christian faith from the Scriptures is an all or nothing proposition. It really is. You either take the Word of God as it is or you, or you deny it completely. All right, And so that's important, not just for the marriage relationship, that it is, in fact, a man and a woman. There is no other option. But it is, in fact, things like sexual purity. For example, we, we, it's not okay to live together before you're married. Hebrews 13, 4 and 5 says, let the marriage bed remain undefiled. And for the younglings in the room, don't do it. In fact, I, I, I'll, I'll do it for you this way. My daughter's a psych major out at Iowa State University. And psychologists have proven that couples that live together before they marry have a higher rate of divorce. Oh, but we're just making sure it works. And then we get married and it doesn't. All right? And so don't do it. If you, fine, ignore what I say from the Bible, but don't do it because it's not good for your marriage. And I'm going to tell you, as a pastor of a long time, I've seen it happen a lot where couples did live together. And by the way, couples that didn't, that got divorced too, you understand, uh, but that lived together. But the most important thing is it's not God's will for you. And I, again, I could name a bunch of other things. We're just going to go to say that it's about uh, sexual purity. But how do we apply that to everybody in the room? Well, that's my job for you today. We do want to talk about Christ's words, but Christ's words essentially upping the ante on sin, upping the ante on sin, going from acting on it to, in fact, just thinking about it, all right? So let me, let me begin by, and I know you know this already, but by defining adultery for you. Jesus says, you shall not commit adultery. And of course, I said this the first service, it's kind of important. Uh, our numbering of the commandments, this is the sixth commandment, but not everybody numbers the same way. I get that email a lot. I met a guy who's got a different numbering. It's okay. There's numbers aren't ordained by God. It doesn't matter. But for us, it's the sixth commandment. And if you went through catechism, you know, again, Luther gets at the idea of sexual sexual purity, all right? So do not commit adultery. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you to a passage in a second, but I just want to uh, uh, give you what we uh, call in the marriage ceremony the declaration of intent. And I always, I always say to the couple that I'm marrying, look, this is the last moment. I'm saying to you, you, do you understand what you're getting yourself into? All right, do you understand what you're getting yourself into? Because this is the last moment. This is the last time you can flee down the center aisle. Hasn't happened yet, but they could, all right, if they wanted to. <laughs> um, I hope that they don't, of course. Now, I, I will tell you that when my father-in-law handed Robin to me, he said, you get to pay for the second degree. I paid for the first one. So it was a very holy moment in my life. But all right. So that's all I remember for, from our wedding. <laughs> it, was, it was great. Oh, and then we stood up in the limo going down the freeway. That was kind of cool. All right. So, but this, <laughs> forgive me. So this is the, the uh, declaration of intent. I'll just do the husband's version of it. So so and so, will you have this woman to be your wedded wife, to live together in the holy estate of matrimony as God has ordained it? Notice God ordained marriage. God is the one. Will you nourish and cherish her as Christ does you? Isn't that beautiful? Nourish and cherish her as Christ does you and all Christians. It's one of the most beautiful lines in here. Will you give yourself in humble service to her as Christ has humbly served you? All that, by the way, together. I would suggest to you married couples in the room, that's a marriage that's centered on Christ. I'm not here for me. I'm here to support my spouse. That's, that's my thing. But listen to what, what is said in the last bit. Will you love, honor, and keep her, listen, Christian, forsaking all others 
forsaking all others, forsaking all others, remain united to her alone as long as you both shall live. And then if you are married, you either said, I will or I do. If you said, I do, you're probably old. All right, I'm just saying, all right. We, we say, I will now. So, all right, let's look at it from the, <laughs> sorry. I, that was really rude. I'm sorry. All right, all right. I, I don't remember what I said, which means I'm really old, so I'll just get over it. All right, so if you'll turn with me to 2 Samuel, if, you, if you're a visitor, the Blue Bibles, that's the page number to help you out there on the screen, uh, the Blue Bibles in the pews. And so this is David and Bathsheba. I'm going to take you to two passages you know well. This is one of them. You know the story, and yet I want to read part of it uh, to get at uh, a truth here. And so David and Bathsheba, you know what's amazing is in chapter 9 of 2 Samuel, David does this great thing for Mephibosheth, which is Jonathan's son, and then he turns around and blows it with God, and he's the leader, he's the leader of Israel. So in the spring of the year, I'll explain this first verse in a second, when the kings, the time when the kings go out to battle, David didn't go, it doesn't say that, but you understand, David didn't go, David sent instead Joab, the commander of his army, and his servants with him, and all Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. Pause for a second. They went out to war in the spring because, you understand, this is not like it is today. They were conquering each other all the time, you understand. they just go in, take the, take the land, take the people, and done and done. So in the spring was when the crops were in, and so the, the wicked army coming to steal God's people away had food to eat while they ravaged God's people. So they went out to war in the spring because they had to. They were, they were forced to. But David remained in Jerusalem. Those words are important. It happened late one afternoon, verse 2, when David arose from his couch, was walking on the roof of the king's house, we sometimes say palace, uh, that he saw from the roof. Notice he, he didn't, she wasn't bathing on the roof. He saw from his roof into her house a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. David sent and inquired about the woman, and one person said, is that not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife, the wife, it's underlined in my Bible, the wife of Uriah the Hittite, David knew. So David sent messengers and took her. She came to him. He lay with her, jumped down to verse six. She gets pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite, husband, get him over here so we can cover this thing up, in other words. Joab sent Uriah to David when Uriah came to him. David asked, how is, he's a little small talk with a guy that I just committed adultery against. David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing, how the war was going, how are things, right? Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. Uriah went out of the king's house and there followed him a present from the king, right? He's trying to make amends. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of the Lord and did not go down to his house. And you know, I think, the rest of the story. He gets Uriah drunk, and Uriah still stays at the place. And so David, exasperated, tells Joab, push him to the front lines, let him die in battle. We'll take care of this thing that way. Ultimately, he marries Bathsheba. The child dies by decree of the Lord. The child dies. And then ultimately, the, the story goes, David uh, has, um, uh, excuse me, David and Bathsheba have Solomon and then, of course, Solomon is the king, but Solomon's also the one that built the temple, uh, and, and David did not. So I bring you here because this is, you know, you don't need me to tell you, that's adultery. He already had a wife. And by the way, the multiple wives in the Old Testament were never ordained by God. Scour the Old Testament, you're not going to find it. He had multiple wives. He had at least eight. He probably had many more than that. Of course, uh, his, his son Solomon had like a thousand that's crazy. Valentine's Day is a mess with a thousand wives. I'm just telling you, all right? It's just a mess, all right? <laughs> and really expensive. <laughs> all right, really, really expensive. Why do I take you? You know this. You understand that it's adultery. This is the thing. Where did it start? It started in the cranium, didn't it? He looked, he saw, he lusted, he committed adultery according to Christ's own words, you understand. And then took her as his wife and committed adultery, physically so, you understand, all right? So I take you there because this is important. What Jesus is really doing, yes, it's about adultery, thinking about it, lusting is, is not acceptable, but it's also about everything else that comes out of our wickedness, you see. And we are good at being wicked. It's, it's this. So understand there's two types of sin as we say it. There's original sin, that's what's in your body. We, you know, I often liken it to a cesspool. 
in my body. This, and if you don't know what cesspool is, I'd be sh- surprised, but just a place where sewer is, all right? So this cesspool in my body, but from original sin comes what we have termed, this isn't a biblical term, but termed actual sins. So I have in my body the propensity, the ability, the drive, you see, to sin, and then from that propensity, ability, original sin, drive to sin comes hate, anger, prejudice, adultery, whatever it happens to be. So that's where it's coming from. And so Jesus says those famous words again, if you look at a woman to lust, you've committed adultery with her in your heart, or him, of course. Ladies, you don't get off the, off the hook that easily, all right? Jesus just knows men well. Amen? Oh, come on now. Amen? I am one. I know men well too, all right? So uh, look, look at Matthew 15 then to get at this very thing, that this idea that it's, it's not just having a physical relationship or murdering somebody, by the way. We're going to come to that in a second. But in fact, it starts up here in the cranium and, and works its way out. And, and let me remind you, what's, connect, what's up here is connected to down here. You're going to hear that in, in a second. So you, this is a text I've taken you, several, you to several times, so it should be familiar. Jesus called the people to him. Remember, they were complaining because they didn't wash their hands before they ate. So Jesus says, hear and understand... It's not what goes into a mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth, and maybe your mama had soap like my mama had soap, right? Uh, But what what comes out of the mouth defiles a person. Then the disciples came to him and said, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying, to which I wish Jesus, again, I've said this before, but would have said, so what? I'm God, they're not, all right? So he he reminds the disciples that the The Pharisees were not children of God. He answered, every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. That is a hard verse because it's saying these leaders of the Jewish people weren't even in the fold. And and you know how you know that. Jesus said, this is John, he says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I'll raise him up on the last day. Notice, if I haven't planted it, they're they're not a part of the crop, all right? Uh, so uh, it'll be rooted up. Let them alone. They are blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, there's the famous wording, uh, both will fall into the pit. But Peter said, explain the parable to us. It's, it's not really a parable, but all right. So the parable to us. He said, are you also without understanding? Do you not see whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? Biology. Here's theology now. God stuff. But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this defiles a person, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands doesn't defile anybody. So again, Jesus is reminding us that out of the cesspool comes all sorts of things. And I'll, re- I'll remind you again, First John says, if you hate somebody, in fact, you, have, you might as well plunge a knife into their heart. If you hate them, you are a murderer. And don't forget, you got to be careful here if you're a Christian, of course, but John also says there no murderer has eternal life dwelling in him. All right? Hate's kind of a big deal, ladies and gentlemen. All right, so I was praying about this sermon, and one of the things that I really feel led to tell you is, yes, the cesspool is here, and we're, uh, let me do it this way, we're quite good at being bad, and all God's people said, amen. All right, we're good at it, but This is the thing, I really want, I am concerned about our generation of people, in particular our generation of Christians, and I want to tell you, you need to guard what goes in, because you guard what goes in, what comes out will be different. Uh, Perfect? No, you still got this mess going on in your body, right? You still got the sinful human nature, it's not going to, it doesn't, I wish it went away, wouldn't that be great if we baptized kids and there was no but it doesn't. You still got that going on. You need to guard it. Um, and, and as a man of God, I, I'm going to tell you, I felt led to push back on some things. You just take the advice where it is. I don't see R-rated movies. I, I certainly don't view pornography. And you ne- neither should you be. And if you are, I, I just counsel you, brothers and sisters, that is not healthy for you at all. But, all right, I don't see R-rated movies. We, Rob and I were watching this series uh, and the first two seasons were on Netflix were really good. No cuss words even. And all of a sudden, here comes the third se- season. 
bam, they just let loose with the cuss words. Well, click, that's not going in my brain. But what about the books that you read, the movies that you watch, the shows that you watch, the things that you allow? By the way, the political things that you allow to go into your brain. Be very careful. You're a Christian. Right? When you get to heaven, God's not going to ask you, are you a Republican, Democrat, or Independent? He's going to want to know, do you know my son and do I know you? All right? And so you need to understand, you need to be careful what's going in here because you got you to gotta, you gotta know what goes in is going to come out, man. You, in fact, you know how you know this? Instagram. That heinous situation with Facebook and Instagram that are making our young women feel like they're trash when they're not. They're a creation, a beautiful creation of God, no matter what they look like. That kind of stuff going in, well, guess what? It's going gonna, it's gonna to ultimately come out. So I want to challenge you, challenge you. What do you, you know, again, what are you reading? I, I told first service, my mama used to call them smut novels. And if you're giggling, that means you're also old, by the way. So, uh, but the novels that are kind of, you know, wiping the sweat, oh, wow, you know, wiping the sweat off of my bow, brow. When my mama was in her 70s, I saw her reading smut novels. And I'm like, time out, mama. <laughs> Pastor Joe's on the scene now. I took the books away from my own mother. I think that's hilarious, all right? <laughs> I think it's hilarious. By the way, God is up there just laughing, going, oh, Joe, you're hilarious. All right, so this is the thing. The last thing I need to tell you is this. So remember, Jesus said those, those infamous words, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out if you're right. All right, so how serious is he? Well, I mean, because let's just get honest here, Christian. If, he, if we have to take him at his word, get your eyes out, get your, cut your hand off, right? But what did he do instead? He did it to his son. The truth about the cross is, Instead of punishing you, he punished Jesus. The sin of every person in the world that would ever live was laid on Christ. Adultery and, by the way, lust and hate and murder and all of that stuff was laid on the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, he plucked his eye out, cut his hand off, even though you understand that's not what happened. But he did so because he condemned Jesus on the tree, on the cross, for us and raised him again for what the Bible says, to make us righteous. Why is that important? Let, no, notice what I said. The Bible says it this way. He raised up Jesus for our justification. It means to be made righteous. That's important because this is the thing, Christian. You can't just say, oh, well, I'm a sinner. Ah, just going to happen. I'm going to lust. I'm going to hate. I'm going to commit adultery. I'm going to do. You can't say that. You're a Christian. You're different. So what does it need? Cutting off your hand, pulling out your eye? No, no. It's something different. In fact, let me give you famous words from Romans 7. Let's say this last one together. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord, right? He's wretched man. Paul wrote that. He's a Christian when he wrote it. He's struggling with the flesh. That's Romans 7. Gets to the end and says, okay, so how am I going to fix this problem? Well, notice it's not him fixing it. It's God. And so let me take you to the last verse, and it's in Ezekiel 36. Last set of verses, I should say. Ezekiel 36. A beautiful segment about the surgery that God has done to you because he rose Christ from the dead so you could be righteous, and I'm going to say it this way, Christian, so you could live a righteous life. The, the segment from 1 Thess 4 that I read to you says that very thing. God wants you to be holy. How, do you, how are you holy? Because he, he uses his Holy Spirit to cause that to happen. So all right, Ezekiel 36, verse 22. Uh, remember, they're in exile at this time. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act. Notice what he does. God glorifies himself, and only God can do that. But for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came, and I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations by you, and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations, gather you from the countries, and bring you back to Jerusalem. That's what he's saying. Seventy years later, bring him back to Jerusalem. But listen to this. I will sprinkle clean water on you. Sound like baptism? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and it doesn't say that. 
but like baptism, sounds like baptism. You shall be clean from all your uncleanness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will, what is this? Surgery, heart surgery, holy heart transplant. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you. And look at that. What does it say? Cause you to walk. Cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my commandments. Why is that important? Well, let me just remind you, unfortunately, the heart of stone does not completely go away. You know that. Out of the heart comes that stuff. So it's like this. The Lord moved your heart of stone over to here. You have to, you'll struggle with sin your whole life. Okay, you got that, right? But he put in you a heart of flesh, his heart. And what does his heart want? The best for other people. His heart wants you to live for God. His heart, by the way, through the Spirit that He places in you, and you know when that happened, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and the forgiveness of your sins, but He also empowered you to say no to sin and yes to Him. To say no to lust and hate and all of the other things that go around in our cranium, and instead to be a person that day after day, week after week, is growing in their faith and is also bringing forth things that are holy because they are of the holy, righteous, pure, and perfect God. That's what this is really all about. Yes, adultery. And, and I, please, I need to say this. If you have experienced adultery, if you are the perpetrator, you can be forgiven. There is no unforgivable sin except unbelief. So if you're the perpetrator, if you have been hurt by that, and I experienced that in my own family, not my immediate family, but my own family, if you've been hurt by that, and these are words that are said to my heart, you can forgive them. You have that option, Christian. One of the most amazing things I've ever witnessed as a pastor was a woman whose husband committed adultery. She forgave him. They're together and, in fact, have a ministry to people whose marriages are struggling. Our church in Peoria, that's that. And, by the way, I wouldn't normally tell you that, except it's very well known there because they've made a ministry out of this thing. That is what you have the option to do. Live for Jesus. Live for Jesus every day. In Jesus' name, amen, brother? Amen. All right. So, <laughs> I almost missed that step. That would have made for an interesting Sunday, right? The end of pastor sermon was amazing. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Bloody nose, face in carpet. It's crazy, you know? So, all right. So, I, I, you know, when I come down here, I want to leave you with a nugget, and it's this. That, you know, the, first of all, please understand, I, I, we're, we'll be married 32 years in December, and people always say, oh, my gosh, that's just amazing and great. It shouldn't be amazing. It is amazing, I know, but it shouldn't be to us, right? Every marriage, and I get it, things happen, and marriages break up, and we, you know, there's forgiveness for that, too, by the way. But, you know, forsaking all others really means forsaking all others. You promised to God and to your spouse. But I want to suggest that we start in a different place. Let's put the marriage thing aside, that those words are between you and your Lord. Forsaking all others, Lord. I am solely and wholly dedicated to my love for you. May you be enabled to do that. By the Holy Spirit and the heart that he's placed in you, may you be enabled to do that in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen.